Hello. You find me on the day of Halloween in the depths of the Cotswolds, and I'm searching for some of the most gruesome tales told about the area. There are many of them. Some terrible things have happened in the Cotswolds in the past. I'm going to find them, and then I'm going to read them to you. The Civil War in the Cotswolds resulted in some brutal and terrible actions. Conspiracy, deception, disloyalty, and revenge. The first story I'm going to tell you is what happened at Chavenage House. On a late December afternoon in 1648, a group of horsemen led by Henry Ireson son-in-law of Oliver Cromwell and leading parliamentarian, galloped along the rutted highways of the Cotswolds and then along the approach to Chavenage House. It was then that Henry Ayrton and Nathaniel Stevens retired from the company and settled down to discuss the important matter that had brought him to Chavenage, the execution of their king. Charles I. With the Civil War now over and King Charles Stuart a prisoner, it had become apparent to Cromwell that the king would have to be executed if royalist uprisings were to be deterred. However, many of his supporters had balked at the prospect of committing regicide. Amongst them was Colonel Nathaniel Stephen a mild man who wavered in making the decision to sacrifice the life of the king, and who, as Ayrton arrived at his door, had almost made up his mind against it. The two men are reputed to have sat up all night discussing and arguing the point, and it was with great reluctance that the next morning Stevens finally acquiesced. Ayrton returned to London and on January the 30th, 1649, Charles Stuart, King of England, was beheaded outside Whitehall Palace in London. The fortunes of Nathaniel Stevens fared little better than those of the King. His daughter, Abigail, had been away at the time of Ayrton's visit. Returning shortly after the new year, she was furious at her father for bringing the family name into such disrepute, and in her anger, she placed a curse upon him. Soon afterwards, Colonel Stevens was taken terminally ill. Shortly after his execution in 1649, the headless ghost of the king is reputed to have appeared at Chavenage House during the funeral of Colonel Stevens. The servants reported a mysterious black carriage, driven by a headless coachman, pulling into the drive and bursting into flames as it passed through the gates. In my continued efforts to find you gruesome tales from the Cotswolds, I was reminded of a story about a young Mercian king told by our normal literary companion, Herbert Evans. I think this is the story I'm going to tell you next. On the death of Kenelf, King of Mercia, in 822, his son Kenelm, a boy of seven years, succeeded to the throne of Mercia. Winchcombe was then the royal residence, and there the little king began his reign under the guidance of his tutor, Ascobert. Fortunately, or unfortunately for him, he had an elder sister, Quenried, who cast envious eyes upon the lad and sought to supplant him on the throne. With this end in view, she attempted to take him off by poison, but so saintly was the holy child that the noxious drugs had no power over him. Her next move was to whisper evil counsels in the ear of his tutor, the mercenary Ascobert. 
and endeavour to win him over to her designs. In this she succeeded, and one fine morning Ascobert invited the boy to accompany him on a hunting expedition to the forest of Clent in the north of Worcestershire. Kenelm was, of course, delighted with the proposal, and off rode the villain and his victim. When they reached the forest, the miscreant cut off the child's head and buried the corpse beneath a thorn bush. It should be said that at the moment that he severed the head from the body, a white dove came forth from the neck and straightway flew up to heaven. Gwenried now reaped the fruit of her misdeed for a time. But it so happened that a year or two later, as the Pope was celebrating Mass at the high altar of St. Peter's at Rome, a dove flew into the building and dropped a slip of parchment upon the altar. His Holiness, observing a certain writing upon the parchment, attempted to read it, but without success, a thing which was not wonderful, seeing that the language was English, then an unknown tongue in the Holy City. At last an Englishman was found who could read and interpret the writing, which ran thus. In Clent, in Kaubach, Kelan, Kings, Bern, Lith, under Thorn, Huand, Berid. That is, in Clent, in Kaubach, Kenelm King's child lieth under a thorn, his head taken from him. Thereupon, the Pope lost no time in sending these strange tidings to the Archbishop of Canterbury, and orders came down to Winchcombe that a search should be made for the murdered child's body. Accordingly, a party of monks set off for Clent and arrived at the Kaubach, where a white cow, herself long a devotee of the saint, guided them to the thorn bush. Here they found the body and were about to take it back with them to Winchcombe when a difficulty arose. The monks of Worcester put in a claim to the body as having been found in their province, while the Gloucestershire men as vehemently asserted their claims as fellow townsmen of the saint. At last they agreed that weary as they were, they should all lie down to sleep, and whichever party woke up first should be considered to be destined by the will of heaven to be the possessors of the relics. It chanced that the Winchcombe monks were the first to awake, and they were well on their way with their precious burden before their brethren of Worcester were aware of their departure. The return journey was managed without adventure, till they reached a point high up in the hillside over against Winchcombe town, and some two miles distance therefrom. Here the good monks found themselves overcome with thirst, and offered up prayers that for the love of St. Kenelm some refreshing drink might be granted to them. Immediately, a second miraculous spring, for another had already appeared under the thorn bush in Clent, gushed forth from the hillside, a spring which was long famous for its wonderful healing properties. The spring was covered with a well house, which may be seen to this day, and a chapel was erected hard by, which was only pulled down in the last century. But to return to the convoy, thus refreshed, the procession filed up Winchcombe Street on its way to the abbey, and here a terrible thing happened. The wicked Quenrine, with her psalter in her hand, was watching the approach of the procession from a window of the palace. As appropriate to the occasion, she had chosen for recitation the 109th Psalm, in which the psalmist calls down the vengeance of heaven upon his adversaries. To render the charm more effective, when she reached the end of the psalm, she began to recite it backwards, and had just reached the 20th verse as her brother's corpse was borne beneath her window. But she got no further with her reading. For at this moment her eyes fell out upon the open psalter, and the book, stained with her blood, was thereafter piously preserved among the sacred treasures of the abbey.
I'm really enjoying this search for gruesome stories from the Cotswolds. It has reintroduced me to one of my favorite authors, H. H. Munro, commonly known as Saki. I have a small, poignant, and wonderful story for you now, called The Reticence of Lady Anne. Egbert came into the large, dimly lit drawing room with the air of a man who is not certain whether he's entering a dovecote or a bomb factory and is prepared for either eventuality. The little domestic quarrel over the luncheon table had not been fought to a definite finish, and the question was how far Lady Anne was in a mood to renew or forego hostilities. Her pose in the armchair by the tea table was rather elaborately rigid. In the gloom of a December afternoon, Egbert's pince-nez did not materially help him to discern the expression of her face. By way of breaking whatever ice might be floating on the surface, he made a remark about a dim religious light. He or Lady Anne were accustomed to make that remark between 4.30 and 6 on winter and late autumn evenings. It was a part of their married life. There was no recognised rejoinder to it, and Lady Anne made none. Don Tarquinio lay a stretch on the Persian rug basking in the firelight with superb indifference to the possible ill humour of Lady Anne. His pedigree was as flawlessly Persian as the rug, and his ruff was coming into the glory of its second winter. The page boy, who had Renaissance tendencies, had christened him Don Tarquinio. Left to themselves, Egbert and Lady Anne would unfailingly have called him Fluff, but they were not obstinate. Egbert poured himself out some tea. As the silence gave no sign of breaking on Lady Anne's initiative, braced himself for another Yermak effort. My remark at lunch had a purely academic application, he announced. You seem to put an unnecessarily personal significance into it. Lady Anne maintained her defensive barrier of silence. The bullfinch, lazily filled in the interval with an air from Aphegenie en Touride. Egbert recognised it immediately because it was the only air the bullfinch whistled, and he had come to them with the reputation for whistling it. Both Egbert and Lady Anne would have preferred something from the Yeoman of the Guard, which was their favourite opera. In matters artistic, they had a similarity of taste. They leaned towards the honest and explicit in art, a picture, for instance, that told its own story with generous assistance from its title. A riderless warhorse with harness in obvious disarray, staggering into a courtyard full of pale, swooning women and marginally noted bad news, suggested to their minds a distinct interpretation of some military catastrophe. They could see what it was meant to convey and explain it to friends of duller intelligence. The silence continued. As a rule, Lady Anne's displeasure became articulate and markedly voluble after four minutes of introductory muteness. Egbert seized the milk jug and poured some of its contents into Don Tarquinio's saucer. As the saucer was already full to the brim, an unsightly overflow was the result. Don Tarquinio was prepared to play many roles in life, but a vacuum carpet cleaner was not one of them. Don't you think we're being rather foolish, said Egbert cheerfully. If Lady Anne thought so, she didn't say so. I dare say the fault's been partly on my side, continued Egbert, with evaporating cheerfulness. After all, I'm only human, you know. You seem to forget I'm only human. He insisted on the point as if there had been unfounded suggestions that he was built on satire lines with goat continuations where the human left off. The bullfinch recommenced its air from Ephigenie to read. Egbert began to feel depressed. Lady Anne was not drinking her tea. Perhaps she was feeling unwell, but when Lady Anne felt unwell, she was not wont to be reticent on the subject. No one knows what I suffer from indigestion, was one of her favourite statements. 
but the lack of knowledge can only have been caused by defective listening. The amount of information available on the subject would have supplied material for a monograph. Evidently, Lady Anne was not feeling unwell. Egbert began to think he was being unreasonably dealt with. Naturally, he began to make concessions. I dare say, he observed, taking as central a position on the hearthrug as Don Tarquinio could be persuaded to concede him. I may have been to blame. I'm willing, if I can thereby restore things to a happier standpoint, to undertake to lead a better life. He wondered vaguely how it would be possible. Temptations came to him in middle age, tentatively and without insistence, like a neglected butcher boy who asked for a Christmas box in February for no more hopeful reason than he didn't get one in December. He had no more idea of succumbing to them than he had of purchasing the fish knives and fur boas that ladies are impelled to sacrifice through the medium of advertisement columns during 12 months of the year. Still, there was something impressive in this unasked-for renunciation of possibly latent enormities. Lady Anne showed no sign of being impressed. Egbert looked at her nervously through his glasses. To get the worst of an argument with her was no new experience. To get the worst of a monologue was a humiliating novelty. I shall go and dress for dinner, he announced in a voice into which he intended some shade of sternness to creep. At the door, a final access of weakness impelled him to make a further appeal. Aren't we being very silly? A fool, was Don Tarquinio's mental comment as the door closed on Egbert's retreat. Then he lifted his velvet forepaws in the air and leapt lightly onto a bookshelf immediately under the bullfinch's cage. It was the first time he had seemed to notice the bird's existence, but he was carrying out a long-formed theory of action with the precision of mature deliberation. The bullfinch, who had fancied himself something of a despot, depressed himself of a sudden into a third of his normal displacement. Then he fell to a helpless wing-beating and shrill cheeping. He had cost 27 shillings without the cage, but Lady Anne made no sign of interfering. She had been dead for two hours. I hope you've enjoyed our stories. We certainly have. There are many, many more I think we'll certainly do this again. Meanwhile, have a wonderful Halloween and keep safe.